Here we are again at the partnership and participatory engagement session of the idea synthesis. Uh, remind you to check out hashtag asteroid partners and join and follow the conversation online. Uh, we've had some good, really good conversations started already. We're about to, to move into our uh, third and final section of uh, this conversation before we then open it up into uh, wide-ranging discussion. And so with that, let me turn it over to David Gustin, who's going to be representing uh, ECAST, uh, and the, the expert in citizen assessment of science and technology. David. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Gustin, and I'm here in Tempe at Arizona State University, where I co-direct a research center called the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, or CSPO. In my remarks, uh, as was mentioned, I'm representing a group called ECAST, the expert in citizen assessment of science and technology network. ECAST is a distributed network that brings together university-based research centers like CSPO, informal science education centers like the Museum of Science Boston, citizen science programs like Science Cheerleader and SciStarter, and nonpartisan policy think tanks like the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Together, we engage citizens on decision-making related to science and technology policy. ECAST organizes deliberations among citizens to inform them about s and policy, elicit their input, and reciprocally inform s and policy makers. ECAST's methods are designed to enable participants to formulate and articulate their own questions so that policymakers may better understand and take into account public values around s and the grand challenge of the asteroid initiative the asteroid initiative addresses is find all asteroid threats to human populations and know what to do about them. Part of that challenge is also communication, to engage in broader conversation with those who are not thinking of or not working on or not caring about such an initiative. Despite the clear articulation of the grand challenge, there are values inherent in the question that are not completely owned by the current community of interest, including advancing human space exploration, expanding planetary defense, anticipating spillover effects of technologies, and charting the nation's future role in space. Thus, statements like that in the August 17th Washington Post rarely has the agency proposed an idea so controversial among lawmakers, so fraught with technical and scientific uncertainties, and so hard to explain to ordinary people, that suggests that a wide frame and a long-duration public engagement process is crucial. We think of this as taking into account what we call the life cycle of decision makers, in which we consider a variety of roles that citizens perform in, as well as a variety of decision makers and points of decision within society, not just the official high-ranking and technical ones. The grandest challenge is therefore to draw otherwise unengaged citizens into respectful, multi-directional conversations about the asteroid initiative and enable them to learn about and make recommendations based on their own questions and interests. Aspiring to this more active, engaged role for citizens, rather than just have them be passive understanders of science, is part of a broader approach that we call anticipatory governance which involves, in addition to public engagement, open-ended approaches to foresight, for example, using scenarios rather than predictive modeling, and thinking about plausibility other than just risk, and integrating knowledge and approaches across disciplines, for example, by encouraging collaborations between natural scientists and engineers on one hand with social scientists and humanists on the other. Taking these aspects ensemble allow for the reflexive governance or management of a new science and technology in an informed and socially robust fashion. A plan of action for increased public understanding of and engagement with uh, the asteroid initiative could include soliciting informed, structured feedback from citizens in multiple geographic regions, creating long-term feedback opportunities for the long-duration asteroid initiative, and providing an on-ramp for citizens to learn by doing through other related and ongoing activities. This shift from public understanding to public engagement 
has already been happening in the Science Museum and Science Center community. And it has involved concomitant shifts from public comment to citizen deliberation, facilitated not only by a change in attitude and a change in understanding, but of course also by a change in technologies. ECAST's experience in this matter includes coordinating the U.S. component of the recent worldwide views on biodiversity. We organized in four cities in the U.S. and coordinated through the Danish Board on Technology with 25 countries and 4,000 individuals around the world uh, to provide input to the 11th Council of Parties of the United Nations, Con United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity that took place in October, 12th, uh, in October 2012. Beyond this procedural role, Test partners extended the conversation through creating an online poll that was hosted by the Koshlands Museum in Washington, D.C., and mirrored on the Discovery Magazine's website. We created multi-sided and zoo projects and museum programs, including biodiversity galleries and a downloadable biodiversity quest, adaptable for use by informal science education institutions around the country. ECAST wants to encourage NASA to include intensive and extensive public engagement as part of the core planning process, the Asteroid Initiative, in order for the agency to best be able to proactively design a program that will deliver on public values. In ECAST's experience, multi-sided engagement could be done at a relatively reasonable cost, and it could be executed rapidly enough so as to inform the immediate mission planning that will follow the initial asteroid mission formulation review. Such work would also complement and extend the initial principles of the 1958 National Aeronautics and Space Act, which directed NASA to share its knowledge to the widest possible practical, uh, widest extent practical. In work, um, such work can be pursued irrespective of the OMB restrictions on public outreach activities because it is actually research intended to gather new and original ideas. Such citizen engagement studies build the capacity of citizens to interact in a more nuanced way that may also have significant value for NASA designers and engineers. NASA may very well perform a more technically capable mission after such public interactions. In the end, the agency will also be better oriented to share resulting knowledge with the public because it is pursuing knowledge that the public has already found to be worthwhile. And in the closing seconds, just let me say um, somewhat more personally, uh, just the other day I was on the occasion of its 150th anniversary reading the Gettysburg Address to my seven-year-old son, Sam. Uh, and Sam, in addition to being a, a budding historian, is a budding scientist and very much loves uh, space and space science. And it seems to me that uh, over its lifetime, NASA has done a remarkable job of uh, being of the people and for the people, and ECAST would like to see it be, uh, as best it can, be by the people as well. So thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd, I'll ask you if you wouldn't mind sticking on the line. Uh, we're going to have a question period and discussion afterwards, uh, and I'm sure there'll be uh, questions for you later on. Okay, I'll try to do that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to Margaret Race from the SETI Institute, who will also be joining us virtually. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I am also continuing the discussion of the uh, private part of um, the private um, part that we are focused on. So while the grand challenge Excuse me, I'm sort of trying to get the, uh, okay, how do I advance my slides? Here you okay. Here you so we're in the grand challenge and thinking about asteroids as both opportunities and threats, and we are thinking about the elements that are related to success. Um, just as we heard from the previous speaker, there's a lot more than just science tech and technology that would contribute to this success. And my talk is focusing on the parts that it also involves the public in thinking about these missions, whether they are the resource 
transmissions, getting outdoors and redirecting them, or the deflection ones. I'm thinking about the risks to mission success, and it's important to identify and acknowledge that there are other impediments than just the technical and science ones, especially since we're um, starting to go down the um, road towards new activities beyond Earth orbit that have really unique features. And what I'm um, suggesting is a stepwise approach to research and technology development that also includes a systematic approach to looking at these other areas. So um, next slide. So when we think about what's involved in the challenge, everyone is quite aware of the need to think about science, whether it's observing and detecting or um, characterizing and modeling and predicting where the asteroids may be. The technology, whether it's a redirection technology, a deflection technology, or perhaps even exploitation, capturing, and using. And um, we have to think about mission planning. How do we design these missions when we think about the new technologies, proof of concept, whether we're talking about deflecting with gravity tractor or kinetic impactors or nuclear. Um, we also have to think about re reducing the risks to the mission. And then the final thing is these partnerships that we're talking about, the collaboration and the other. So on the right hand of my screen, if you will look at um, where it says the science and technical experts, the, um, generally what we know is that science and technical experts look at what to do and how to do it. We take an incremental approach to things. We do the research and technology development. And in this case, our success means either on the one hand, we're going to save the world or develop new markets and develop new space. Uh, ne next slide. Um, oops, sorry. Um, that's how the scientists see it, but here's how others see the risks. The general public um, is saying, you want to do what? Not what are you going to do, but you want to do what? And they're asking questions about should we do it and what could go wrong? And when we think about a natural threat or a phenomenon like asteroids, there's a lot of partial or misinformation out there, in some cases even disbelief belief or conspiracy theories. And um, when we're talking about moving around asteroids, there's the potential that we take a natural hazard of some sort, and if we do something wrong, it's seen as turning it into a man-made problem. So what we're talking about is looking at the risk to the missions that are caused by responses and views and actions by the public and individuals. Because this is different than um, an individual making a decision to do something. This is the government or commercial groups making a decision and the individual or the country or the societal group has little say in it. They're asking questions about who's responsible for making these decisions. Do you have the authority to do it? What are the geopolitics of it? asking questions, as we heard earlier, is it legal? Is it in compliance with U.S. law in this case? Uh, have you done an environmental impact statement? Are you being transparent about the information? What about lawsuits that might happen um, that would result in temporary restraining orders and um, holds on launches? They're asking questions about, is it right? Is it ethical? Are you playing God? Um, and there's, a, in some cases, a distrust of technology. What if things go wrong? And so on and on you can come to these kind of questions that the public has. What we do know from research on risk, there's a repeated pattern and a process that we see of experts versus public views. This isn't the same as ignorance or fear. People, um, that we have to recognize the multiple publics that are involved and think about a stepwise approach to addressing these. Um, I'm coming at it from my experiences on the Mars sample return mission, where the risks have to do with bringing back potential life from outer space that might be biohazardous. And so we identified and addressed all of the potential mission impediments, legal, psychological, uh, psych, um, uh, risk perception that people may have, uh, education and outreach that may help it. And we took a systematic approach to exploring these new areas. And in the case of the features of asteroids as threats and resources, the public really is um, generally uninformed about it. They just don't know about it. And they do have unique concerns. And we're entering into new areas that have legal and policy questions that are beyond Earth orbit. If you look at the scientist and technology view of hazardous asteroids, for instance, 
and putting it in the context of the disaster and natural hazard literature, what we're talking about is a general threat. This general threat is looking at how do we detect them, how do we deflect them, and how do we make decisions about them. The notion is that once you can detect it and then you can decide if it's a threatening one, you can go ahead and deflect it somehow and then make decisions at the world level that everybody is happy about and launch a mission and have an impact and success. And if you're not successful, um, then you can address questions of evacuation or other actions that might be appropriate. But another way to view it is a much more accurate one, which is that we're really talking about more than just a general threat. If you think about natural hazards, there's a general threat of a flood or a hurricane, but then a more specific one, once that hurricane gets named as Hurricane Charles, and then an imminent threat to the people when it's coming tomorrow. And so we have to think about those levels of information as we go along, because it's far, far more complicated. And in the public context, what we see is that um, the, the notion of asteroids is not in the collective um, public perception. They don't know things like orbital dynamics, direct impacts, keyhole deflection, risk corridors, deflection choices. The time delays that we have between warnings, false alarms, uh, having pseudo experts get involved is really something uh, that we need to think about. And there's, of course, geopolitics and decisions about what sizes of asteroids to deflect and whether nuclear might be involved. So all of these questions are amenable to the kind of work that has been done in the risk literature all along. Um, for those involved in asteroid redeflection and resources, you're not out of the picture of some of these risk problems as well. People are um, asking questions about who's making decisions and why should you be able to use those things, as we heard earlier. There's questions about legal challenges and NEPA, own ownership and claims to them, private property, outer space treaty issues, and so on. And if you look at the outer space treaty, for instance, all these years we've been in geospatial, uh, geostationary or a low Earth orbit, and those are where we've played out all the legal issues. When you look at the moon and other celestial bodies on the right hand of this chart, the only thing that has been involved has been issues of planetary protection and science missions. So all of those issues that we're talking about come up brand new, whether it's asteroid mining and redirecting, um, questions of ownership, claims, retrieval, and um, U.S. law or whoever the agency is. So whether we're looking at asteroid um, challenges as um, the opportunities of using the resources or the threats from deflection, there are a lot of other elements beyond the science and technology. So for the path forward, it's important to also think about those and include them in the stepwise approach, include research drawing from the experience of the natural hazard literature. How do we link this in with a theme of people and others who will be acting upon it? This isn't a matter of just turning over saying, I found it and now it's your turn. We have to think about how to um, address these potential mission, imped mission impediments, especially for the asteroid um, impact hazardous, uh, hazardous asteroid impact and deflection areas. And there's a long lead time in this, just as in any other research. So it's important to look ahead. We want to make sure that as we get to that point where we're ready to launch, that we have provided more than just one-way information to the public, that we really are addressing what they need to know in order to make that our success um, be their success as well. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to invite you to stay on the line as uh, we'll be moving into questions and discussion after uh, we finish with our presentations, if possible. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Next up is uh, Joe Lepore representing Space Design Corporation. All right, uh, my name is Joe Lepore, and uh, I'll be giving a uh, talk on Space Design's Asteroid in 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 Initiative paper. Um, although I'm giving the talk, uh, this, uh, this presentation was uh, developed and written by Joseph M. Clay. I just want to give him his due. 
So I'd like to start off uh, and begin with the background on how we started preparing a uh, paper for this in, in initiative. We, um, we, we looked at the forces on a asteroids and um, in summary we're looking at, uh, we looked at gravity, uh, coll collisions, radiation pressure, solar wind, and then there's, there's some o others possible magnetic mass, fl uh, mass loss and mass flow. We're going to be fo focusing on the radiation pressure and the uh, solar wind pressure. And uh, radiation pressure is comprised of uh, two uh, com c components. Uh, first is the uh, direct incident. And the second is a uh, Yarkovsky uh, uh, effect. And the Yarkovsky effect is a, uh, uh, a uh, di directional radiation pressure. It's caused by temperature variation from ro rotation. And it's a force that's acting on a rotating, rotating body, and it's, uh, it's caused by a difference in the direction of the absorption and the re-emission of ra ra radiation. So essentially there's a lag between the uh, incoming radiation and the temperature change of the uh, body, and that causes, it, ca causes that force. This is a very small force. So if we were to look at some simple re re relations for the radiation pressure and the solar wind pressure, the radiation pressure is a, a function of the uh, s solar flux and the uh, s speed of light. And if you were to uh, re reduce that down, you would find that the uh, solar intensity will decrease with the inverse square of the distance from the sun. So that's R1 over R2 squared. And similarly, if you look at the solar wind pressure, if you were to assume constant vo vo velocity, uh, you, it's going to be a function of the uh, solar wind uh, de density, which is n, and the speed. And when you reduce that down, you also find that, that it's going to be a function of the, a, the uh, inverse square of the distance from the sun, also r1 over r2 squared. So if we were to use those two uh, re relations and plot out what the uh, pressure would be at various distances from the sun, this is what it would, would look like. We have two curves, one for the uh, average radiation pressure, one for the average solar wind pressure. And you can see that the uh, average radiation pressure starts out at about 80 newtons per square kil kilometer. So that's uh, uh, kil kilometer squared. Uh, so it's, it's acting over a very large, l large surface area, and uh, we, have, we have listed, you know, several planet lo 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 locations. Then also we have listed uh, 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 Eros, and that's the asteroid that we're going to be focusing on, and it's at a distance. Uh, it, it varies from a distance of about 1.1 AU to 1.43 AU. And we're, we're, we're looking at uh, Eros because uh, of its uh, differences in exposed area. So it, as you uh, ro rotate it, you can change what, what its exposed area is, and, and therefore you can change the amount of force that's being up applied to it. So looking at the control of the radiation pressure and the solar wind pressure, both pressures can be controlled by changing the, the area exposed towards the sun if you could theor theoretically uh, ro ro rotate it. And there's our test case, Eros. And we, we're looking at a, a conservative minimum uh, uh, area, exposed area of 98.5 square kilometers and a, a maximum area or a, a, a lib liberal value maximum, maximum of uh, 374 kil kilometers squared. So um, also with the control of the radiation pressure, it has an added advantage that it can be controlled by changing the op optical properties. So if you had a, a optical property on the surface that was black, that would be having a solar abs absorptance of 1.0. And if you were to, able to change that and move off to the right on this, on this chart, you could go all the way to absorptivity of zero, which would be a specular mirrored s surface. And and by doing that, you would be able to effectively change the magnitude of the radiation pressure by a factor of two. So that's a, a, a second way that we can con con control the, uh, the uh, force. 
so if it, now if, if we look at what the maximum forces are um, at the apogee and the perigee of uh, er eros, what we, we look at here is the uh, the uh, the delta. Since we're able to, uh, or we we can theoretically rotate the uh, 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 er eros, we can change what its exposed area is. We can see maximum differences of 1361 uh, newtons at the apogee and. 2254 newtons at the uh, per, per, perigee, and, uh, and and newton is about a, a quarter of a pound. So just to give you what what kind of ballpark values we are look look looking at there. So now, if we if we theoretically move the Earth into the path of uh, of uh, er, er, eros, so this is not the actual location, obviously. But just the the theoretically, if, if, if we did that, we're looking at what, what would the delta V on the far left there, the delta V B, have to be in order to change the path of uh, arrows so that it would, would then, then uh, miss the Earth. So you need to change it by at least the, uh, the radius of the Earth, which is 6378 kilometers. So in, in just looking at some simple orb, orbital me mechanics, we calculated that the delta V would have to be about 0.24 uh, meters per, per second. So if you were to use that 0.24 meters per second and then use the, the, uh, the, um, the max force that we showed on, uh, or I showed on um, slide seven, and the, uh, the mass of uh, Eros, we can calculate how, how long it, it would would, uh, would take in order to uh, 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 achieve this, and it comes out to be about thirty seven thousand four hundred Earth years. So um, obviously that doesn't look like a uh, practical uh, uh, s solution. And e even if you, you were to substitute in instead of the thirteen sixty one, even if you were to use the uh, the, the maximum force um, at the uh, per perigee, we're still looking at tens of thousands of of, of, of years. So now changing it up just a little bit, we're talk about the partnerships uh, or markets for uh, par par partnerships. And um, can markets be defined to support NASA's asteroid in initiative? So in a very, very general sense, uh, technology drivers are uh, ne needed to uh, create technologies which would feed these, these uh, hypothetical mar markets. And what we want to do is to uh, de determine what these uh, mar markets are. So uh, looking at kind of a simple view of NASA's current ar ar architecture, you have the uh, SLS, which is used to bring or Orion out to a l lunar DRO, distant retrograde o orbit. And you have uh, CEP CEPHEO, which can be used to uh, uh, capture a small a asteroid, maybe 10 to 12 m meters in size and then use uh, solar electric propulsion to uh, pu push it back where you could rendezvous with uh, or Orion. And then you could do a um, EVA to, uh, to go off and uh, e examine and uh, st study it. So what we're looking for are markets to fill this type of ar ar architecture. Okay, almost done. Um, and w w one of these would be that after this type of, of a mission is complete, then the asteroid is, is left there at the lunar DRO for further study. So in conclusion, the radiation forces and solar wind forces are significant but not capable of full-scale asteroid deflection. So uh, other forces must be found to successfully de de deflect the asteroids. And market forces could be used to guide the NASA architecture and per perhaps a public-private partnership could uh, help. Thank That's you, it. Joe. All right. Th thank you. Next up, we have uh, Tony Freeman joining us from the Jet Propulsion Lab. He will be joining us virtually. Good morning. Ed. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, it just wasn't able to fit that in the, the schedule this time. But uh, thank you for letting me uh, talk about this topic. So what I'm here to do this morning is actually solve all the problems of the Asteroid Initiative by bundling together all of the ideas into a coherent program uh, that 
then NASA can defend and move forward with. And I had help putting this together from Bob Cesarone and Joel Sassel, uh, but also Steve Matusek. So programs are how NASA does business. Uh, we have uh, many programs within NASA, within the human programs, the, the, the science programs, and Earth science in particular, living with a star, for example. Uh, and the Astro Asteroid Initiative is very well suited to such a structure. So here's the list of programs that, that we pulled together that showed some of the amazing programs that NASA does. Uh, some of them, like the Mars program, were voted the most successful program in the U.S. government. Uh, that's hard to uh, imagine, but uh, that a NASA program would be judged that way. But, you know, we do a pretty good job at this particular uh, type of management. But there is no current overarching NASA program that's targeted specifically at small bodies, whether that's asteroids or other bodies like comets. The closest we get is the Near-Earth Object Observation Program, which is great, but you know, it's a, more or less a standalone activity. So who would be the stakeholders for a program? Well, the science community, uh, human space flight, who are targeting asteroids as a destination, uh, the commercial world with space resources, and then, as we've seen in some of the other talks, planetary protection. It's pretty easy to map the initiative activities into a traditional program structure with advanced studies, technology development, robotic missions, ground-based observations, crewed operations on the manned side, commercialization, and education and public outreach. So what would the objectives be? Well, if they, you could argue about this for days, and I'm sure if NASA set up a program structure, there would be arguments for days about exactly what the wording was, exactly what the objectives were. But it would be something like increasing the opportunities for human space exploration beyond Earth orbit, along the way to Mars, protecting the Earth from future asteroid impacts, and fostering a new commercial space business that uses the resources that these asteroids represent, with U.S. industry leading the way, and advancing key space technologies essential for the future. And if something like that could be agreed on, a lot of decisions become very easy afterwards. To look at the priorities, you could take uh, a sieve like this one, which represents on the left-hand side all of the RFI inputs that bounded into ground-based observations and technologies and science and partnerships and different widgets and payloads, different ideas for missions, and you could bundle all of that together in a road mapping activity that used something like the JPL-18 to brainstorm, uh, analyze, prioritize, and then synthesize options that were highest payoff for the stakeholder community. And then examine the space components of those in more detail using something like our TMAX, which does a very good job of point design. So lots of technologies, uh, I'm not going to list all of them off, but obviously solar electric propulsion is on a lot of people's minds, uh, robotics and autonomous systems, the kind of sensors we need. There's an underlying base of technology required, and most programs have that, or they go to the office of the chief technologist and say, here are our requirements defined to meet these program needs, and please implement a technology program that, that addresses that. Another advantage to, to having a program structure is you get out of the, the lottery game. If you look at the missions listed here that are NASA, either APL or Goddard or JPL, uh, they're either, when they addressed an asteroid or a comet objective, it was done as a very secondary or tertiary science uh, objective along the way to the main target, or it was done through the, the competition of the discovery and New Horizons programs. And that's great, and the, that asteroid science has done pretty well over the years. But if you talk to the folks who work in Venus science in the planetary world, they haven't won the lottery ever on discovery 
and new frontiers. We haven't had a Venus mission since Magellan. And past success is no indicator of future performance, as I'm sure most of you are aware. So there's no guarantee that you'll win a Discovery or a New Frontiers competition with an asteroid mission in the next 20 years. So it could be a long time before we see another asteroid mission in the competed world. In a program structure, you get to define your requirements, have some work that's assigned, some work that's competed, and it's much easier to get that uh, addressed. Uh, the items in red are all the international missions that we could identify that addressed uh, some of the objectives of asteroids and other small bodies. And I have to say that NASA involvement in these is, uh, at best, minimal. It's usually one scientist or two scientists on the science team who are you know, communicating with the rest of the community, but uh, the, the, the missions don't get to ad address major objectives for a program, which would, would be beneficial. I have to say the ground-based community does a lot better job of this. They communicate quite well across the international community, and there are commercial involvement, uh, as we, we've learned in this workshop, uh, that seems to be working pretty well, but I think it would still be better bound up in a program structure. Uh, one objective that you might identify for a program uh, is a, an outpost for a translunar asteroid, where you take the asteroid and if people go to it and provide capability and leave it there in place for others to use, they are then entitled to a use of some of the resources that are available there, which include the material on the, the asteroid uh, for either science use or for commercial use or to demonstrate a new technology that could advance uh, human exploration. Uh, most programs have uh, commercialization arms and that's usually done through the commercialization, te commercial technology offices at the field centers or within NASA itself. And, and then programs have education and public outreach where it's a coherent strategy. Again, I, I hate to bring it back to Mars, but the Mars rover outreach has been widely praised. Uh, it's part of the Mars program, uh, and it's, it's basically a planned activity that supports the missions and the science and the technology development uh, all as one coherent package. Uh, and then finally, the missing piece in the initiative was science. Uh, nothing wrong with that. NASA programs do have uh, elements that are independent of science, but there's enough science going on in small bodies and asteroids in particular that you could bundle that in under the auspices of a program and steer some of those science opportunities towards advancing the overall objectives of an asteroid initiative. So I think that's the, the conclusion of my talk, is basically this would all be very nicely wrapped up in a bow in a program. It's what NASA knows how to do, and it also gives you a line item in the budget that you can defend to OMB and to Congress and to the National Academy and whoever else has an interest in that. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> and if you too wouldn't mind stick, sticking on the line if possible to uh, be able to join in uh, answering questions as they come up in the discussion. Um, sure, I'd be happy to do so. Very good, thank you. Uh, and our last presenter, um, Jean-Claude Piedbeuf, representing the Canadian Space Agency, uh, will close it out for us. Jean-Claude. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, and just to say, I'm replacing uh, Christian Lange that prepared the slide, and he, he was participating to the last version of the workshop, but was not able to come this time. Uh, so we, the first slide said 30 years of space exploration, I would say uh, more likely it's 50 years of exploration in Canada. We started our space uh, program 50 years ago and, and it was interesting, the discussion on commercial activities. Uh, I think space exploration is opening the, the way, it's a new frontier and in Canada when we started 50 years ago. Uh, to sense thing in space, it creates now a space economy in Canada, like I mean in SATCOM, uh, 
uh, navigation and uh, air observation. But this is really because the government started and said, okay, we want to explore space, that uh, these industry exists today. And so when we talk about space exploration today, we are now building the economy of tomorrow uh, by doing the exploration and going. Uh, we are in LEO, uh, we go, uh, and we go uh, beyond Earth orbit. So this is uh, an important aspect. But more recently, our exploration has been focusing on, on uh, space robotics, uh, vision system, and uh, also contribution to a uh, science mission, uh, especially for Mars, and, uh, and some asteroid mission. And uh, space astronomy is also a strong focus for us. So <clears throat> the international con context is important also. Uh, the, from a human exploration point of view, uh, since a few years, there is a discussion and uh, uh, some uh, of you uh, have been participating and know about the global exploration strategy that was created or written and uh, it was interesting it was started uh, after the, the NASA announcement of the moon uh, return and uh, our US announcement of the U moon return and the international uh, community was uh, asked to, to participate and uh, so we at that point, with the, the international community said, okay, Moon is good, but Mars and Asteroid and Lagrange Point are also good. And so NASA said, okay, we will include everything in, the, in this global exploration strategy. And one of the results was also the creation of the ISEC, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, that again is focusing uh, a lot on human exploration, but also including science and, and more and more are looking how can we uh, manage robotic and human exploration together so each benefit uh, from each other. And uh, there was the, the Global Expression Roadmap published in 2011, and a new one uh, published uh, uh, this year, a revised version. So these are documents that are a kind of a, uh, agreement between uh, at least 10 space agencies, uh, mainly from uh, North America, US, uh, North America, Europe, and, uh, and Asia. Uh, but so it is significant. It, it's really showing uh, a direction where we, we can go in terms of exploration. And recently, also, the benefit from space exploration has been published. Uh, it's clear from, uh, from a Canadian point of view, and I think it's clear for others also, that uh, space exploration needs to respond to the priority of the government. And if it's not doing that, uh, asteroid, moon, or Mars, or anything uh, will not go forward. So the global expression roadmap uh, is interesting in the sense that uh, we saw okay, the long-term uh, vision is that to have human on Mars. Uh, we know we already have robot on Mars uh, since a few years now, and, and, and a recurrent series of missions. So from a robotic point of view, Mars is uh, well. Uh, the program is underway already. But from a human point of view, this is the, the long-term view uh, from uh, many space agency. And in the meantime, we need to develop some uh, capabilities to, to go there. And uh, the system in our space is a good place. And asteroid also, uh, it, it's a good way to learn uh, to do that. So from a Canadian point of view, we have been focusing of, on few technology in terms of space exploration and in terms of the space program in general. And I, I will mention a few here, but I, I will cover that at, by saying we are focusing on optics and robotics. That's basically the vision system and robotics and, and starting a few uh, new things. We recently, uh, as part of the 2009 Economic Action Plan, government gave money to uh, additional fund to the, the Canadian Space Agency and we developed the next generation of the space uh, arm, uh, which is an advanced generation. And this one could be used uh, for uh, space servicing and, and an asteroid mission uh, uh, to retrieve a sample or to basically capture uh, things. So this technology is uh, especially the small arm uh, that you can see here, which is like the Dexter, which is on the space station right now. It's, uh, it's not far to be ready to fly. And we have a new uh, long arm that is uh, telescopic boom now, so that can fit on a on smaller uh, uh, launcher vehicle as compared to the, the space shuttle where the, the Canada Arm 2 was launched. We have been working also in active vision system for a quite uh, some time. Uh, Canada started with uh, a kind of optic vision system uh, in the early day of the, the space shuttle and the space station, and uh, realized that uh, optic, it's not 
easy in space because of the lighting condition and so switch really uh, to the kind of laser based uh, camera and since then we have been using that for many uh, activity and one of them is the when the the shuttle needed an inspection system uh, NASA went to uh, a company in Canada to procure that uh, system because we have been developing uh, and, and it was already demonstrated for space utilization. On the Phoenix mission, a Mars mission, we provided again another LIDAR system to measure the atmosphere. Uh, there was some commercials uh, like uh, XSS-11, it was done uh, a pure commercial cell also to use a LIDAR system to track uh, a satellite. And we more recently we, de we demonstrated a tridar, which is a kind of uh, laser system again, to uh, estimate the pose of a vehicle. And we are providing, uh, and it's really uh, pertinent here, is the uh, laser system again for uh, the mapping of an asteroid uh, for the Osiris Rex mission, uh, which is designed based on the XSL-11 and the Phoenix. Uh, so you, you can see there's some continuity and there's a strong expertise in Canada uh, to provide that type of system. And this is a, a bit of detail on the OSIRIS-REx uh, laser altimeter. So uh, obviously this is a, a system to do a rendezvous with an asteroid. So it's pretty easy to make the link with an asteroid mission. The SIS system could be uh, improved and, and make better and could be a, almost a direct contribution uh, to such a, a mission. Uh, I heard that there, there was uh, there is not much observation of a uh, near Earth object. Uh, recently we launched uh, uh, a small satellite, a micro satellite, uh, this size. Uh, to, and one of the, the goal of this satellite is to observe near Earth objects. So, and I think, if I am right, it would be the first one to, to be dedicated to do s such uh, an activity. It's based on the, we had the uh, MOST, which is uh, a microsatellite for space astronomy, which is very successful, was designed for one year and has now has been for 10 years in space. So, and uh, so this, uh, this, this new satellite, NEOSAT, is still in, uh, in uh, going in, uh, not confirmation, but we are uh, trying to find a term, but uh, basically uploading the software. And we have not yet done the first, uh, capture the first image, but uh, it should be do done soon. So this one is, uh, could be also a uh, contribution uh, to, uh, to know at least where you want to go. If you want to capture an asteroid, you still need to, to find where. And uh, lastly, we have been working with, uh, I would say, mainly NASA uh, for, uh, for the moon mission. Uh, which is the was called Resort and now called the uh, Resource Prospector Mission and developing the rover and, and the drill. And the drill with some adaptation obviously uh, could be used for, uh, for an asteroid mission if you want to, to capture uh, a core. Uh, this is a uh, drilling that, that do a core uh, sample. And uh, we have also a mini core uh, which is, can be used uh, just to do a, a very small core. So the, the, the drill can do, I think, one or two meter core now. And uh, so that type of technology with uh, some adaptation because it's based on uh, here on gravity and moon, even if the gravity is slower, uh, there is still some gravity. So in conclusion, the, this asteroid initiative is uh, it's, uh, interesting. Uh, we uh, will follow that closely and see if it's materialized in, a, in some, uh, in some uh, real mission. Uh, and and uh, we have the, the industry in Canada has the, the capacity to provide something, and there is uh, some interest from a, a Canadian point of view to do so. Uh, so we, we are looking to that, we are studying that, and, and we think it's a, it's a good, good opportunity for, uh, for Canada to position the, the, the Canadian industry. And obviously, it's need the government, uh, it has to. Uh, be based on government priorities, and in Canada we we are revising our space program, so we we will follow that uh, very closely to see if something can be uh, contributed. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our presentations for today. I'd, I'd like to, if possible, focus the questions for the next couple of minutes, 15 or so. Uh, from the last group of speakers. 
uh, and then we can transition in uh, in more of the wide-ranging discussion of uh, covering all the ideas that, that have been brought forth. So, uh, Joe, do we have anything coming in? Yeah, um, actually more of a comment than a question for uh, Dave at, uh, David at uh, Arizona State. This is from Linda Billingsley. She uh, um, indicates that there's a need to engage all, um, everyone to participate in the, del in the deliberations and invite disruptors uh, into like-minded groups. And I don't know if he wanted to uh, expand on that any at all. Uh, thank you to, to Linda for that uh, comment or question. <clears throat> And the invitation of disruptors into groups of uh, engaged in public deliberation is a great idea for certain purposes. And there are times when uh, you want uh, those disruptions, when you want to have some divergent thinking, when you want to uh, shake things up, and there are other purposes uh, for which you need uh, more convergent thinking. And, you know, I think that should NASA or any other uh, agency decide that it wants to engage uh, in a broad-based public deliberation activity, uh, it has to be very clear about the kind of uh, public engagement it wants and whether that role will be to open things up a bit, um, broaden and disrupt some current thought, or whether it wants uh, some more convergent kinds of recommendations. And you have the same kinds of uh, issues that crop up with technical advisory committees as well that operate under consensus or that uh, operate under different kinds of rules and that get different direction from the agencies to which they're giving advice. Thank you. May I add in a comment here? This is Margaret Race. Please. Okay. The disruptors idea is a very good one because um, there's what we need to do is be be mindful of the fact that this is not single discussion, single decisions that are being made. Um, at the recent Planetary Defense Conference in Arizona, it was last April, um, there was a conference-wide simulation that involved everyone that participated, and they took on different roles, um, whether it was uh, looking at the science, the technology, and some of the issues that came up with asteroid deflection were quite surprising. So some groups of people took on the role of being individual countries, for instance, making decisions within the context of the UN. And they actually voted against the asteroid deflection. Um, there are questions of having a nuclear launch, for instance, who would that outer space treaty would have to be waived in some way and we don't have a proof of concept. So there are risks at many, many levels, and the idea of bringing in disruptors or at least acknowledging that these risks are real is something important. And that's what um, I think both David and my uh, focus is on, thinking ahead to the kinds of risks that can come up to the mission and the kind of success that we want to see. But those risks are coming in areas that we can't necessarily address with science and technology. So we have to think about how to go through the actual process of uh, communicating not one way, but um, looking at what information we're going to give to experts in a FEMA situation, what information we give to the public, the mass media. There's just so many places. This is Dave again. I would, I would endorse that uh, very much. Thank you. Any questions in here in the room? Uh, this is a question for the um, Yarkovsky effect on the Eros uh, analysis. Um, so uh, that's a, a, a dozen kilometer sized asteroid. How do the numbers play out with an irregularly shaped, like, 100 meter sized object? Um, I really don't have Could, data for that. I really don't have any uh, data on, on that right now? I would have to uh, co consult with uh, Joe Clay on that. Uh, it would be oh, great sorry. to see an analysis okay. like that. Right. Any other questions for this last panel? Let me throw one out. Um, And this may get our discussion started as we uh, seem ready to, to transition into the discussion that I'm hoping will uh, facilitate uh, some sense of, of what the findings 
uh, out of this session ought to be because ultimately this is our session uh, to be shared together. We had a number of presenters that were selected um, based on their RFI responses and, and now is an opportunity for us based on that uh, to engage in conversation that, that will lead into uh, the planning process. And so uh, I'll, I'll focus it on this last panel, but we can expand it beyond as well. And, and that is, uh, how would you measure successful public engagement? It's easy for us to talk about um, that this is something that we want to do. Um, but and maybe particularly for David and and Margaret to to kick us off on that, and then a follow up to that. Um, can you give us some examples of success from your perspective, so that we have an idea of something that we might be working towards? I know there was a a little bit of that, uh, David, in your presentation, uh, but I'd like to expand on that some. Okay, thank you. That's an incredibly critical uh, and important question about measuring the success of, of public engagement. And I think the trick is to realize that just like with other forms of advice uh, or technology assessment, that the critical measure is not necessarily that there's some silver bullet that comes from the public and uh, has a discernible impact on exactly what's going on. Uh, if we use that criterion, then a whole lot of, for example, what the National Academies does would not be uh, worthwhile doing. But I think our criteria of success need to rest in the area of capacity building and learning among both the specific and the broad array of individuals who are involved in the activities. So have the people who have been engaged learned not just substantively, but procedurally and, if you will, reflexively about their own role in the process. Have the uh, elite actors, the folks, say, at NASA who are designing programs and projects, have they learned, maybe they have learned something substantively through the interaction, but more importantly, have they learned about process and have they learned about how to, re how to approach their activities more reflexively um, with a greater degree of, of self-awareness and awareness of uh, the public role that they're pursuing. And that, that learning opportunity begins to build a capacity, as I think I tried to suggest in the, uh, in the talk, of making the public and making the folks in the agency with whom the public is engaged more sophisticated and more nuanced about that conversation. Now, there could be real and concrete influence on the project itself, um, and that would be a goal as well, but I think the success really has to be measured by the increased capacity in the learning that goes on among the participants. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Margaret Race again. Um, it, when I look at it um, in terms of the natural hazards community, um, there's a lot of research that's been done over the decades on how do we respond to natural disasters and threats of different sorts. And if you look at the history of something like fire, we know what fire is, the public knows what fire is, they respond to it, and there are examples of it all the time. So we're kind of, um, we have a collective memory of these things. Asteroids are very different than that, especially when we're talking about uh, asteroid deflections for planetary defense. Um, there is no collective memory. The public doesn't understand a lot of the terminology, and it's unclear even what we would do to tell FEMA-type agencies or regional emergency response folks uh, what to do. So there's a lot of behind-the-scenes information that has to go along with this. Um, and we want to, again, think about not just one-way delivery of information to the public, but information that they can use. Thinking in terms of just the typhoon, for instance, that just happened uh, in the Philippines, that's what we're up against. Um, we're up against the potential threat of something like that. And what would we tell an individual, especially if we have a multiple year warning of something like that? Um, what is an evacuation in those situations? Um, this is, so these this are is things that are 
important to consider ahead of time. They don't change the fact that the science and technology is looking to deflect um, the asteroids, but on the ground, dealing with the risks in, and talking about the education, it's way more than just asteroid deflection. It's really risk in government, governance at the um, local area. This is Tony Freeman. I, I think you raise a very good point. There's a good analogy to the 2004 tsunami. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been a long time since we'd had a tsunami that was that deadly, and you know, technology, science, a lot have changed since the last time we had one of those things. And afterwards, a lot of really good work was done looking at the concept of operations. How do you get people alerted? How do you get people warned? What technologies do you use? But also, how do you educate them? And I think that's a very instructive area for us to look at for the asteroid program. Um, uh, speaking from California, I can tell you that we have sort of a 10-year window when it comes to earthquakes. If you don't have them every so often, people sort of get complacent. And then yeah. there's the issue also about the decisions. In Italy right now, there has been a, a legal case where some scientists who suggested that we wouldn't have another earthquake are actually um, found guilty and are facing um, prison time for liability and making a wrong decision because people went back to their homes and then the earthquake hit and people died. So yeah. this, this will play out, and certainly in terms of... Uh, I'll say a Chelyabinsk situation. Um, it could have been worse, but there's one where it came in from the blind. Nobody could even have uh, predicted it in time. So we have to recognize that these things will happen, and that's part of the education that gets given to the public as well, the uncertainties. Thank you. Jean-Claude. Yeah, uh, I will see public engagement from another point of view. We, we just had a quite successful uh, astronaut in space with Chris Hartfield and which basically was able to attract public attention and, and it seems spontaneous but it was really a preparation uh, more than two years of preparation to do that so public engagement it should not be done only on, on uh, fear of something but try really and, and not just to, to learn or to educate the public it's really the public is basically it's public money. So if the public is not supporting that, is not engaged, it's very difficult to sustain uh, an activity. So, and we have been thinking about that, uh, given the success of the, the Chris uh, flight and how much the public like it. Uh, could we repeat that from for robotic mission? And uh, and and probably yes, but we have to really uh, think about the public engagement as a requirement. It's like a requirement that we need a sensor to do this thing, we need a, uh, to capture this. We need some requirement that will be linked purely to the, the public engagement. And, and this has to be, think, uh, very early in, in the, when you design the mission and not after the fact and say, okay, we, we do that for science or for uh, protection and then, oh, by the way, we need now to engage the public because this is part of our mandate. And so it's really something you have to be ready to spend money on engaging the public and maybe adding an HD camera on your system, which has no uh, scientific goal, which has no technical goal, but you will provide nice image and, and you have to also to engage the public in all the difficulty of your mission. Say, so, okay, now we have this and, and we are designing this, this is difficult. If you don't give the information and you are not using the social media the way it has been used with uh, Chris, then it's very difficult to engage the public. Thank you. The, the, oh. the, uh, the difference again with the um, on engaging the public with the um, positive part of space and even the idea of putting a camera on is very good. And those things are very positive, even the Mars missions and engaging the public in basic research and exploration. And so the asteroid um, deflection and resource use missions may be perceived differently there than the risk of a hazardous one. So there are, there are two different kinds of communication that have to happen. And I agree that the public engagement of a positive sort is very important, but we also have to address the risks on the other side. When I hear the term engagement, I actually think a little bit more strongly than in the context that's being used here. 
um, I think engagement is something that's deeper than simply being a, you know, a click through on a web link to a mission page. I think if you want to engage the public, it's going to involve things that actually actively get them to participate in. And I'm not sure what those things are, but I know that certainly in the world today, people engage by spending money, they speak with their pocketbooks, they speak in career choices, they do other things. And I'm just not sure that these passive observations of missions are sufficient engagement to really make this work out in the long term. Uh, before we jump into qu um, further thoughts, uh, Jen reminded me, t we're going to be uh, focusing on that very thing this afternoon in the crowdsourcing citizen science as well as the next gen engagement tomorrow morning. Uh, so we will have an opportunity to kind of dig in there a little bit. But I saw a bunch of hands go up and there's a mic up in the uh, audience well, already. Do you want me to wait then? Please. Well, I was just going to say, uh, along those lines, uh, there are, in fact, several ways you can engage the public that are not just the follow along, read up on the stuff. And in fact, we're, we're engaging several different uh, platform, different companies, where the crowd is used to develop parts of your system, whether that's simple videos or software or uh, PR uh, infographics. And so there's actual public ways that you can get people involved in the development and operations of your missions. Uh, and there's lots of those platforms out there now. So uh, we work with them, and that's a little plug. But we can talk more about that this afternoon. Um, regarding this the, is, go ahead. This is Dave again, if I may. Please. On the strength of, uh, of public engagement and the way that the say ECAST and the the Science Museum and Science Center community has come to understand it is that the difference between the sort of public understanding which would be the click-through uh, activity and public engagement is really about a two-way conversation and one that goes deeper than simply technical understanding but has to do with understanding the kinds of values that are brought to bear on the agenda and the framing of any particular initiative and I think that, yes, a lot of those crowdsourcing techniques are able to engage people in the sense that they become active participants in the research, in the exploration, which is wonderful, but that tends only to happen for people who are otherwise paying attention. And that doesn't quite create opportunities for people who may not have attention, may not have the skills to participate in that way. Um, and yet those other kinds of people still deserve and in many uh, instances require the opportunity to help frame through their own values the kinds of things that are being done in their name. Um, I'll let Charlie address the public outreach crowd stuff because I know he's an expert at that. But coming from the, uh, the, the defense side, which is I think where the, the speakers were addressing, um, there's a very interesting and subtle game that gets played often. For example, um, the US military cannot advertise or lobby publicly as far as recruiting people, but they can run recruiting ads, which are super cool and make them look like superheroes and enroll the public and keep the public support for the military high. They can legally do that, but they can't advertise support your military. Now, in the quest to deal with the defensive aspects, the uh, um, uh, civil defense aspects of things, and, and in that activity, by engaging in that activity, the education that goes with it, hey, we may have a tsunami, here's what you do in terms of that tsunami, and getting people in that preparatory mode and educating them as a part of that, what you can actually do, and this is probably appropriate for a private sector guy more than a government sector person to talk about overtly, is what you're doing is very slowly and in a very careful way building constituency for support of larger activities in that realm on the planetary defense side. So by getting out there and talking to people about, I, I, I have seen people walk into congressional offices of, of legislators who had coastal districts and literally walk right up to the map and go, if a tsunami of this size hits here, eh, this part of your state's gone. And that gets their attention in, in a very interesting way. And, and then you go in and talk to local officials. We're, uh, I handed uh, the new mayor of Houston 
a copy of Rain and Iron and Ice and said, you might want to look at those gates you're putting in the Houston Harbor uh, idea, things like that. So you can get them going in that way, and then that can translate into broader support. And I'll give that to Charlie. Thanks. Um, to try and address Jason's question, um, as I often say, I think the answer is all of the above. Uh, clearly, we need engagement and participation pre-launch. Clearly, we need engagement and analysis on threats. Clearly, we need to measure quick click-throughs and how many people sit in Times Square to watch the event. Engagement, as correctly was pointed out, is a spectrum of opportunities, whether it's, in our case, upload your song, or we have a Spanish poet from the 1700s whose family are contributing poetry to the Cosmic Archive. What my experience has been in now almost 20 years of providing public participation missions is, is I knew back in 1982 when I was a, a young man and we had a rocket on the launch pad at Matagorda Island that when that rocket took off, that was a feeling that, that I'd never had before because it was my rocket. I was involved in the mission. The same is true for our Celestis missions. When they know their, when the families come and they know their loved one is fulfilling their dreams, that's a connectivity to what might otherwise be a very boring mission of a Korean satellite into space that carries on and interconnects over generations. Uh, for Sunjammer, we've created what we call mind files and bio files where you can send yourself uh, into deep space as part of the archive. We'll have an interactive mission control. We'll have the first private mission control uh, that uh, will permit people to come in and uh, after certain uh, qualifications actually steer the, the spacecraft. So there's innumerable, the public's hungry to be involved in space and to be directly involved in space as opposed to <clears throat> watching, what's the phrase I heard, a few highly paid civil servants orbit the earth. That's great work, but the public doesn't necessarily connect to that. When they're really involved, personally involved in some way in that mission, uh, as I mentioned to the owner of the rocket that we flew on last year, you may think that's your rocket, but I've got 500 people here with families on board who know it's theirs. And that, that kind of connectivity does come from more than just a link following and reading about the information. It's active engagement throughout the mission. And people want it. Mm -hmm. And not only do they want it, they will pay for it, just as they pay for experiences today. And those funds can be used to do future missions or to enhance current missions. And the fact that we're beginning an era where that's OK, where, it, where it's no longer uh, oh, this mission is mine, I'm the government, you can't do anything about it, with it, or touch it. Uh, we're, we're, we're past that, I think, now, and I think you'll see broad elements of engagement, such as the kinds of things that, that we're looking at here. All right, and I just want to try to make a clarifying comment, because I think there's, there's three games at play here. Uh, so there's engagement about the risks, which I think Margaret had a lot of interesting things to talk about. Uh, there's engagement of how do you have like a hit sensation when you're, you're in the middle of it, the public is following along and they're really enjoying it. And then there's this idea from David's ECAST presentation about sort of citizen policy. How do you figure out what the, the broadest goal should be? How do you figure out what the next Crits Hadfield robotic mission should be? Or how do you figure out um, exactly what the public thinks yeah. should be the right balance on, on risk and future asteroid missions or exactly what they think the goal should be there? And I, I think what's so interesting is an intellectual framework from this anticipatory governance that was proposed by ECAST is that they've also got uh, specific experience in proposing different activities on how to actually pulse the public and to try to have its, it's this nuanced inter, interaction where it, you can't really get it through crowdsourcing. It's having experts who help present the information and the material in a way that's accessible to like non-standard actors. And um, I think it's, it's a different framework that uh, is worth taking away from this. Hmm. Can can we uh, pull up the discussion uh, slides? I'd like to uh, spark some. I've, I've got some more questions that I've put on a slide uh, to help us 
kind of zero in a little bit. As you pull up the slides, this is Margaret Reese again. Um, I think the last speaker speaking about the different ways of looking at communication and engagement is the, the real key. What the problem is or the, the, um, the challenge is is that we have to make sure we in, engage the public in appropriate ways across all the different things. It, it's not just this is not PR, this is not just giving people science information. We really have to be very attentive to what it is that um, and what part of the mission or the objective we're informing people about. And Zach, I would add a fourth category, actually, as we're talking about kind of a higher level schema that you started to lay out, the fourth category being the public or individuals meaningfully contributing to components of either the mission or the grand challenge. So the amateur astronomer that goes out and takes the observation, or the folks that are subscribed to SLU, which we'll hear about later this afternoon, that are actually using um, telescopes that are owned by a broader community and, and, and finding time on that telescope to do observations of their own, or crowdsourcing through existing data on things like Zooniverse. Like planetary resources is going to be doing. So actually contributing to the meaningful work as well, not just participating in discussions or being informed. One uh, very serious consideration that needs to be taken, very, well, it needs to be taken very seriously is that you guys are here representing the front end of a, conce a conceptual shift of getting the public involved. When you go back to your offices and it hits a wall of lawyers and it hits a wall of policy people, it begins to evaporate. One example is here at Johnson Space Center, they've built this great little building that is all about uh, hackers and makers and it's really cool and it's got great furniture and dry erase boards and there's a 3D printing machine and it's like, beanbag chairs, it's like ready for that, you know, well under 30 crowd to roll in there and get creative. The problem is um, it's inside the gates and you have to get badged. And that's a lawyer problem where the intention was right, but there is not an understanding that that whole process of government badging, for example, is antithetical to the very blue jean culture that they are trying to get in there and innovate with. So when you carry back all these great ideas, there needs to be a depth of penetration back into the agency so that it doesn't end at the superficial front end of, of this event. So that the lawyers get a memo from their bosses saying, we need you to review, because they're not in this room with you guys getting this input. You're gonna carry out some great ideas and they're gonna die on a lawyer's desk. I'm, I'm, I'll take exception with that in the sense that I was late to this event yesterday because I was speaking to the OGC uh, staff uh, about this very mission. Uh, and Jen can probably speak much better than I because she's been uh, partnered with the uh, general counsel's office for quite some time. and. I would say that we've got a really great partnership with the attorneys that we're working with at our level. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've done time in NASA, I left and came back. And I would say it's better than um, I've ever seen it. I hear examples that Bo Naz gives about um, uh, a, a CRADA method that's, that's working really well and Charlie Chafer's talking about the, the sun jammer, and so um, I, I think w we might be perceived as kind of a front edge, but I, I, I don't feel that if that is actually what the perception is, that it's just a couple of people up here alone. There, there are a lot of people behind I, I us. I wasn't inferring yeah. that. I'm just saying that that's a constant thing. As the gentleman uh, mentioned earlier about the NIAC proposal. Yeah. Okay, that Got, was a good example. That's a great example to, to, and see, that's why this is helpful. And that's why it's so fantastic to be here in conversation to say, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. But we can go back and have that conversation and say, hey guys, because the intention is good, we just don't always uh, execute. Uh, and so this is where it's helpful to, to bring this stuff up. Well, in that case, yay team, go. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so this is where I wanted to pivot into uh, some discussion points because we focused in on engagement. Um, but really throwing it out, we've got not quite a half hour left. Um, and we got an opportunity to, to put some findings in uh, that will be factored into to some planning. And so um, it was great to hear about the NIAC uh, uh, difficulties. Are there other areas that you're struggling with that when we look at trying to build partnership opportunities uh, going forward, what can we do to, to, to be better and more responsive? Are there walls that you've, you've come up against beyond just NIAC? If you could design the system on your own, blank, blank piece of paper, uh, So I'm going to maybe go back to Scott's presentation yep. as, a, as, a, as a launch point. So one of the things he mentioned was a demo day. Yeah. So if you're trying to build something new and different, one of the things you face when you run into the government is they've been doing it their way for quite some time. And unless you have an opportunity to show them what you're doing in a kind of a free, free and open environment, you don't often get that audience. And I think something like a demo day uh, is a good way for you to see that there's something else out there. There's a better uh, way to do some things. Uh, you know, some of the traditional processes like SBIRs or STTRs, uh, they just get buried in a corner somewhere. Maybe that's a way where you can get more uh, of those ideas out in front and then allow them to, to show you what, what can be done kind of against the old guard. This is Tony Freeman at JPL. Uh, NASA also have a, a tool, a vehicle they can use to partner with industry called the Cooperative Agreement Notice. Uh, it's actually pretty powerful. You get a lot of latitude. Uh, usually industry has to bring some matching funds to the table, but it, it, it actually has been used in a wide variety of areas to get direct involvement and engagement. David. A simple thing that would help uh, outsiders feel the shape of the elephant would be uh, easily accessible org charts for offices. Some parts of NASA do publish org charts. Others, you just have to deduce who reports to who and uh, how, <laughs> how the structure is built. OK. Good. And I'd suggest going beyond the org charts back to what are the actual um, technical challenges that are out there. A lot of times um, you need that seed. Uh, I think back 15 years uh, to being in college and trying to figure out what to do as a master's project and not knowing uh, what the real challenges were and where there would be value. If you can lay out that underlying framework, not just the high level uh, strategic goals, but examples of some of the pieces to start getting people thinking about where they could contribute and where their capabilities and resources best align. So as, as a member of the uh, robotics concept integration team, you know, I was talking with uh, David and uh, Rick just a while ago, but uh, what would really help us is if you could really identify that just the top three areas that we can take back to headquarters or Kirst or whatever and say, this is this suggestion, these top three suggestions would help better enable our mutual relationships. So if you can give me some food there that can be taken back and then and maybe we can do something about this. Yeah. Do we have do we have a sense of what the top three looks like? I can add some of the things that I heard during the conversation um, to try to um, add some more fodder. Um, one was, of course, uh, the visibility um, aspects that you that you brought up. So, um, trying to make sure that NASA can also play the role of helping potential partners that are seeking mutual interest get some visibility from their partnership as well um, uh, in in doing so with NASA. Um, I think some of the others that we heard were NASA can just simply state things. David, one of the things that you mentioned was NASA stating um, the importance of in-space resources 
just stating the importance, and that can serve as a uh, kind of advanced market commitment of sorts of the future of space exploration uh, that could help drive some of the companies that are seeking to get uh, it's seeking to drive that activity in space. And so there's some things that are communication activities, right? Making statements, taking positions, helping promote um, was one kind of set of activities that we saw. But then also I heard many comments on the vehicles that we use, right, to partner. I think it was also you maybe that brought up the uh, 300 pages of requirements that you had to read through to submit a three-page document back, right? Um, so the RFI in many ways was a first step to engagement, how do we continue that? But the structural kind of elements of how you partner, CREDA or cooperative agreement, as Tony said, or FAR or COTS or PRIZE, or and there's many mechanisms um, that could be used differently, but making sure to um, look at which mechanism might further the mutual benefit that everybody wants the most. So it's two that I heard, there might be others. So dovetail off of yours a little bit, I think some clarity around NASA's own business model. Where do you want to be the builder doer versus mm -hmm. the buyer mm -hmm. versus the collaborator uh, at different points of the mission? And then allowing industry to push back and say, yeah, you said you wanted to be the doer of that, but that is so simple. Why would you spend big government dollars to do that? Or that's the most lucrative. Why would you spend big government dollars? That's where we can be motivated to go do that. So some clarity around that. And I think that gets back to David's point as well. We, if, I, if you make that statement that we're going to be a buyer of this service, there are going to be 20 companies pop up and figure mm -hmm. out how to deliver it. Mm -hmm. and if you say I'm going to be a doer of this service, well, I'm not going to go build that because I don't have the pockets to necessarily compete unless it's extremely lucrative. Mm -hmm. home on that because I've been pounding on that one for about 20 years and that's the idea that at that top level if the government can sit down and go okay settlement science and safety those are the three main areas we're looking at when we're dealing with 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 uh, NEOs or, or you know safety in terms of planetary defense science in terms of expanding the scientific base of humanity or the US um, and settlement is uh, we're going to be we're blazing a path for you so you lock those in at the very top level and then bring together some people from the different communities um, and this is a part of it this is a part of it and maybe some more expert people in a different setting um, the ones who are really hands-on directly involved and then maybe on the more crowd grassroots thing you know more people involved and sit down and go okay in each of these areas once you have that top level decision, your other decisions under that cascade out of it. It becomes clear. If the goal is settlement, then you have to have an economy. If you're going to have an economy, then the government needs to look at every activity it's doing as to does this enable the development of a comedy, an economy, which is what he was saying, or does it inhibit? You know, are these operational tasks? Can these be handed off? Or are these ones that uh, catalyze? Uh, are, should we be an anchor tenant or sh should we announce we're going to build the building even though we know somebody else can build that building and we could just be an anchor tenant and enable them getting financing to build that building. There are a lot of models actually outside of space where government does that very effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, the FBI or IRS rolls into a city and says, we're going to have this floor of the new building. We are now an anchor tenant. They can get financing and build the whole building. Those kinds of relationships. And then by putting it in terms of this is we're not doing it for you, you are doing it with us. And then that trickles all the way down to the crowdsourcing and getting the kids involved and everything. Because it's not NASA astronauts performing, climbing around the popcorn package, pulling out gravel on, on an asteroid or something. It is an entire series of activities that involve the entire broad US public pushing forward on these different areas that are going to lead to these three things that they are a part of and they will reap the rewards from and it's their face at the end. It's their kid that's going to be going out there. That kind of thing makes it, makes it personal. Um, this is, um, Rick said something earlier about giving the book a rain of fire and ice to the 
Houston, new Houston mayor. And this is a comment about the messaging that's contained within the idea that NASA states something. You know, uh, the, um, after the last uh, workshop meeting uh, that Sunday, 60 Minutes had a great spot on the Chelly Bents uh, uh, explosion and stuff. And um, I was thinking, oh, this is fantastic. What a great way to represent the risk to the public. But at the end of it, the NASA scientists who were there really kind of, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying they understated it. I think they were very accurate. And, but I think there was the, the amount of drama that could have been contained in their statement missing. You know, they really said, oh, you know, I left the program saying, oh, well, they said it's really nothing to worry about. And I think that's not exactly the messaging that is most convenient to the situation. This, this gathering in the RFI has been um, pointed to as, as a step. Uh, how, how, how has this felt? Is this uh, valuable? Ha has this opportunity to gather and, and discuss um, been a valuable process? How would you change it? Uh, if we're recognizing that we're trying to get ideas to plan and move forward, how would you design? What, what would that look like? Sorry. Um, yeah, you guys have been awesome. I, I mean, I think it's great that you're doing this. And again, if you can get the depths and carry it, penetrate deep into that headquarters building in DC, that's great. Or, or more importantly, maybe the center director's offices. That would be even better. But. Um, the, uh, find an auditorium that doesn't have theater style seating, <laughs> okay? Because it implies that you're talking to us, mm. uh, might be part of it, or, or have breakouts that go off and work on focused areas and bring it back yeah. and, and that kind of thing. But, but you, I, I definitely want to say, I've spoken to a lot of people, um, people that weren't here the day after the original one got canceled and weren't blah, 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 you know, officially anywhere or whatever, but people who interacted and um, they feel really good about what's happening. And I think you're, you know, this is a good approach. The rest of NASA could learn from you guys on this, I think, so. Any of the questions that are thrown up on the board, how would you like to participate with NASA are there technologies that, that we can focus on? Uh, we've got 15 minutes. I don't want to belabor it. If we feel like we played this out to however far we're going to get, we can break early and people can grab lunch. Uh, but we do have 15 minutes left if, if there is a discussion that needs to be continued. Yeah, and I might frame one of these questions in uh, getting towards the statement that you made about the top three things to go back and take to Gerst from your perspective, would be what would, what would you say would be the top opportunities in the near-term window to um, enable and to partner with the commercial sector and the public in general on this initiative to better position it for success in both areas? So what are the opportunities? Thinking maybe about the nearer-term stuff, because that's the stuff that we need to get moving on, right? But what might be those nearer-term opportunities and tactics? Uh, this will be more self-serving than it intended to be, but I think it's around identify um, because it's the most tangible set of technologies we have today, whether they're ground-based or space-based, visible or IR. Those are things that a broad community of people understand very well, how to make sense of that data and do something with it. And it goes beyond just the professionals. I think this is where uh, you can get into crowdsourcing. Uh, you can mobilize semi-pros and true amateurs to do some portions of the mission. Right? There's a lot that we don't know about asteroids in general, not just where they are, but even ones we know where they are, we don't know a lot about them. Uh, so there's a lot of work that could be done there uh, in, a very sh in a very quick turnaround where you could reach out and start mobilizing a lot of excess capacity to get back to engagement. I think you want to know if you engage somebody, it's how do they use their excess capital, whether it's their time, their resources, uh, their mind. Uh, 
I think that can be done in a hurry. And I completely agree with Clinton that identify is a, a good early opportunity, but I think uh, so that we don't lose sight of the next step in parallel, we really need to start focusing on the technologies that do need to be developed so that there's an understanding out there of what we should be working on and we can articulate what it is that we need to be part partnering on, what steps we need to take so that once we are even in a better position than we've already gotten to uh, from the identify standpoint, we know how we can actually get out there and interact with Nastra. Um, I got the impression that Sunjammer, and I know that B612, these are, are two um, semi-commercial or uh, certainly fundraising endeavors that uh, enlist the public by offering some participation. I know you can give money to these projects and in some way have your name associated with the project. Um, I, if, to somehow attach the NASA meatball to that notion of public participation um, seems like something that could be explored. I'll go one more. I'm looking at the pictures behind your head thinking uh, somebody at NASA probably cooked those up. Maybe you have an image contest and ask someone else what they think Identify looks like. Does it look like a $30 million facility with a three meter optic? Does it look like, you know, an ISS EVA suit for Explore? Do, even conceptually, right, that sort of sets a tone. Do you go in somewhere else and get someone to set the tone of, of the idea behind all of these things and see if that sparks a different direction in terms of doing some of the work? Great. The... Uh, um Basically, it's a bottom, the bottom line is get on with it. Um, operating at uh, government salary pace and aerospace salary pace, especially for entrepreneurial companies like ours, you guys are going to have some sort of industry day next spring. That's a million years away for us. Okay? We're burning investor money now, and as, a, as is the other company. Um, so do, it, do things now. They don't have to be the major things, but things that begin to break the catch-22 of can we work with these people, are they real, how do we prove it, and start doing those things. On the crowdsourcing side of things, go uh, and, and the, the broader public involvement, get started now with something. Don't wait for the perfect plan, the mega giga plan that somehow fits into your 2015 roadmap activities or something like that. Start now with something that is, the, as they say on the internet, a minimum viable product and gets you rolling and indicates that this is real and not a kabuki dance or a road show, which I don't think you guys are engaged in. But the proof is always going to be in the action starting, both on the public side and the company side like ours. Anything else burning? <coughs> Please. I'm actually carrying the microphone, but I wanted to just to make a comment about uh, some of the discussions that's been um, made on crowdsourcing. Um, there's been some discussion about maybe the informed public that can contribute because they've got the resources or are in groups where they're being able to contribute and maybe uh, the other spectrum of the general public that might just be informed in this area of crowdsourcing or being able to actually provide um, some sort of funding towards a project or towards an idea even if it's not fully developed yet allows people to really feel like from a public standpoint that they have ownership. I really liked the idea of the mind files that go up because people feel part of the mission. Be prepared for, expect, and grow from failures along the road. Not all partnerships are going to work. Not all crowdsourcing is going to get there. I, I looked at one a few weeks back that was a lunar mission that raised seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> well, man, if they can do it, <laughs> I need I need several of those things. But it's really important, you know, when a 
private guy puts their a gal puts her money at risk and succeeds, she gets wealthy. When she fails, it's tough times. When a government gal puts the agency at risk, which is how any of these partnerships are viewed, they're viewed, oh my God, what can go wrong? What will Congress say when this thing fails? And, and when the agency succeeds, often as not, people go, well, you didn't need that much money, we're gonna cut your budget. Uh, but the person gets a plaque on the wall or something that doesn't get personally rich, but when the agency fails, there's a whole city called Washington that I lived in for 20 years that just jumps all over it. And look at, you know, look at this uh, uh, Solyndra example in space kind of thing. So I think that going into partnerships where you invite goofballs like Rick and me to uh, participate, you gotta qualify us. There's no question about that. You can't just enter into a partnership with everybody, but you have to not expect to bat a thousand along the way, and you have to structure them so that people don't get harmed when that happens, but it can't send the agency back to, okay, now we're back to Apollo the way it should be, because that ain't gonna happen anymore. So be aware that not all of these great crowdsourced missions will ever fly. Not every partnership that NASA enters into will succeed. But you don't need it. You know, part of it, when it's much lower cost and much more diverse, uh, diversity of, of organizations trying to get there, they don't all have to succeed. You have to have a good batting average and you can't waste money. But at the same time, some of the best things I've ever built and done have come because I really goofed up previously and, and oh, I can't do that anymore, I have to change. So that's, that's a difficult culture at NASA to embrace. Uh, I applaud, I, I've seen night and day strides and, and, and I've been doing, you know, Jason knows I bought a Minuteman missile from NASA in 1982. You know, I'm still the first and only U.S. citizen ever to buy a Minuteman missile. That was a really unique partnership that, that Neil Hosenball, who was the general counsel, figured out, well, I can't really sell you a Minuteman, Charlie, but I can sell you the rights to use it. And if you don't bring it back in the same condition that you borrowed it from, you have to pay full acquisition value. So that... There are innovative, there have always been innovative people. What I see now is more of an innovative culture, and that's, that's because the, 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 I, I, the fingers out of the dike, the damn, the gene, you know, pick whatever silly analogy you want. There's just too much commercial stuff going on to ever bottle it back up and go back to the days of Apollo. I, that's not a viable model, but the, the new model is not gonna be pure you know, light at the end of the tunnel. There are gonna be some hiccups along the way and you should use those as learning events mm. and, um, and uh, not, not seek out to fail, but not punish failure by saying, well, that model doesn't work, we're never gonna do that again. Yeah, great. Any other thoughts? Good thought? All right, folks, uh, I think this has proven to be a really, really successful session this morning. Uh, we had 55 respondents uh, provide ideas that got down selected to those that were presented here today. Huge thanks to those that, uh, all, of, all of you that took time to put in a proposal. Um, and for those that were selected to, to take the time to then prepare a presentation and come share with us. Uh, and then all of, all of you that joined us to participate in this conversation. I, I really do believe that it is the, uh, the first of many steps forward. And I feel like we have a lot of good material to pull in to the findings that we'll share in the plenary. Uh, and uh, really appreciate all your time and energy to, to get us to where we are at this point. So with that, let us uh, close maybe three minutes early. And um, this does not end the conversation. There's uh, hallways 
and internet and uh, relationships that I hope we've, we've started that will continue this as we move forward. So with that, I thank everybody uh, and we will adjourn our session. And please remember to attend the crowdsourcing and ah, citizen science session this <laughs> afternoon. You can see us again, yeah. but in flipped roles. Um, and on Friday morning, you can see us again, again flipped. flipped. Um, for next generation engagement. And in those two panels, we'll really be talking about meaningfully engaging um, individuals um, in the work of uh, the grand challenge element of, uh, of the initiative. So we please encourage you to come to those and be part of uh, those discussions, especially since um, it's been stated by some of the folks in the um, audience that that's where we're going to be likely doing a lot of the initial work right out the gate um, to get started on this activity. So we uh, would really love your feedback um, since those things are uh, quicker in the hopper. So thank you very much. Thank you.